are you doing? I'm good. Um, well, I've been in Zoom meetings since like uh, 10 a.m. So. <laughs> I'm glad we could uh, provide you another okay. opportunity. <laughs> yeah. I try to not schedule meetings on Monday. Yeah, but. I, I can't imagine because this is the only time I do it every week. So I can't imagine the people that have to do it like all day, every day for school or work or whatever. <clears throat> yeah, I'm glad well, I don't have to do it for school. We'll walk around our neighborhood and like couple of houses out of every block there are people like on their front porch you know having zoom meetings <laughs> it's like it's just everywhere yeah <laughs> it's hard to escape yeah i mean it's nice that we have that option yeah i'm better than the alternative which would be not doing anything right. or risking um, it was like the first, uh, um, online classes. I, I haven't taught a lot online, but the first couple of classes I taught online were like almost all just like discussion boards and email and, uh, that kind of thing. And there's something there's, I mean, there's an upside to that because everything's very thoughtful and deliberate because you're, you know, you're thinking through everything before you say it. And uh, there's something sort of valuable about that, but I think it, it really, you know, takes that immediacy kind of dynamic out of the equation that I think is an important. I mean, the things I remember from college, the professors that influenced me the most, I don't remember much about what they said, like the content. I, more than anything, I remember like how they talked and how they treated people and like the, a lot of those intangibles, you know, those in nonverbal kinds of things, how, yeah. to be, how to be an educated person in the world, uh, sort of, you know, those were really important lessons I learned from them that I don't think I would have gotten over text, you know, <laughs> not entirely. Yeah, well, I like being able to do this via Zoom. It it's a little more engaging than just discussion posts. Right. right. Let me uh, email our guests and see if, uh, make sure they're not having the same problems we've had before with people trying to get in. Sure. How's everybody else? Good. Excellent. Good band. Thanks. So I may need at some point a Zoom expert to tell me why we sometimes have these log on problems. What do you mean log on problems? Well, almost every session I have either our guest speakers or I'll have a couple of students that'll say that they, they're like in a waiting room trying to get in and nobody's there. And, and I don't see them, like they're not on my, mm -hmm. 
roster here. So, and then I, I just. Wonder, I wonder if they're clicking on an old link. Well, I'm, that's what I'm assuming that like something I sent them, you know, a week or two ago or whatever, it's just not the same. Well, in the student's case, it would make sense that maybe they're hitting a link from a previous class. Mm -hmm. But speakers, like it's the only, it's the only link I sent them. And I, yeah. I've wondered like if something gets like tweaked in the algorithm or something somehow, I don't, I don't know. So you can also, if you go to like participants at the bottom um, and you click the little arrow that's pointing up and click invite, you can send them like a direct email again right. to the Zoom call. So I just emailed them to make sure. Um, if I uh, hear back from them that they're having trouble, there he is, there's Steven. Hello, sir. Are you there? I'm here. Hey. Where are you? Where are you? Can you see oh, me? there you are. Hey. How are you? Are you you're at your office. So I am. You didn't want to have this conversation with the whole family? <laughs> I would have loved to have interruptions by children and dogs, but unfortunately, I'm still <laughs> at the office. I couldn't get home fast enough. I live too far away from campus to make it home in time. Right. Oh, that's true. I guess it's uh, still close to work hours. For, for you working. Yeah, and I'm not out here every day, but I happen to be up here today pretty late. Right. So. Are you teaching mostly online? Or are you, uh, how much are you teaching? Cause I'm not teaching at all. I'm not teaching at all um, because I'm the dean, but um, yeah. we're about half and half. About half of our classes are face to face and about half online at the college. Okay. Yeah. How about you all? What's your, how, how are you breaking it up? Um, well, our campus is mostly face to face with lots of precautions. Um, yeah. But I, you know, we had this uh impending grandchild birth with health problems in our home so i told them you know from day one like i'm not because we're doing strict quarantine like i haven't been in a building other than the hospital to see my grandson in like two months yeah, so wow. um i mean obviously i'm in a building now but you yeah. know my home <laughs> that's a good move that's probably a smart uh, smart to be safer. Well, uh, it was partly just, I think, smart, and it was also like clear parameters laid out by our grandson's parents. They're like, if you want to be around our child, here's what you got to do. We're like, that's right. that's right. Message received. We will obey all protocol. Obey very well. Right? <laughs> Hi, everybody. All the students when we were uh, starting out that. Uh, uh, that I, I loved them and cared about them, but I loved about my I loved my grandson more than them. So <laughs> I, think, I can't imagine anyone would have been, been offended by that admission. I hope not, but <laughs> you know they were. Oh well. <laughs> uh, if, I don't think I love you like a grandfather is a creepy kind of thing to hear from your professor. So I think it's probably better the way you did it. Boy, <laughs> good boy. Good so uh, I saw that your uh, your edited volume like race and ethnicity the new volume just came out second edition yeah it'll be available this week but you know they send the author copies a week ahead of time so right. you can send one to your mom yeah because i saw that you had it in a box but then i looked it up it wasn't like i don't think it was on amazon yet yeah it's up on amazon but it'll say uh you know say you know this, oh, pre -order this, or whatever yeah pre-order still or whatever so i think i think um i think uh next week maybe is when it's supposed to be cool yeah, as good as the second edition. I mean, this is, I, I swear after the first edition, I would never do it again. Yeah. <laughs> and then they asked, and what are they going to say? Right. I don't know. You're, you're it, a sucker. The second edition is a little bit easier, but, it, you know, uh, that volume has like 70 contributors from all over the world. Right. It's, it, so it makes it challenging just logistically to get people to turn things in on time and to standardize the writing style and all. I mean, it's different than if well, you just do it. It's a topic that's like evolving so rapidly. Yes. And, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Charlton. You just hey there. there. There he is. Hey. Hey. How's How are you? Going? Good. How are you? I'm well. Well, good to see you. Good to see you. Are you are you at your office or are you at home? I am at home. I have so, not returned to the office yet. Yeah. Well, you haven't been in at all then. Yeah. 
No. So you're so you're in Brooklyn. I'm in Brooklyn. Um, home base, and you know, ironically, my office is well. At least one of offices is right down the street because we have a Brooklyn campus. Wow. Um, but then my my actual office is over in uh, Washington Square in Manhattan. Right. Uh, building, but uh, we so have a lot they, of. So is NYU doing? Are they like? kind of a hybrid or are they back in classes or are they yeah we're, we're doing everything there's students in classes in person on campus on campus and remote around the world remote you know pretty much every permutation right right yeah. all right well I think we're pretty much all here let me double check I don't have anybody waiting um, so just a kind of reminder to, to Stephen and Charlton, who this is a communication ethics, uh, class. It's a, uh, kind of an entry level graduate course for students. It's a combination of students who are getting a master's in communication and students who are getting a master's in nonprofit leadership and nonprofit and civic leadership. Is that right? Somebody correct me on that. Okay. Um, and, um, and so we've had, uh, we try to start most of our classes off with this sort of kind of short, um, well, it can be as long as we want it to be. I was going to yeah. say, don't make any promises with Charlton. I'm all for it. I'm here for that. Um, we've had a couple of our guests have been uh, super busy people that I think were very just very gracious to give us their time at all and so I was like you know we kind of tried to make it pretty brief but uh, I'm all for a, uh, a, a longer thoughtful engaging conversation if you guys are I just don't want to keep you you know if you're sure, that's fair. Uh, if you we'll need, try to we'll try to we'll try to make good on at least a couple of those adjectives Okay. <laughs> Can't promise so, all of them. <laughs> so for the students that, to know the connection here um, we all ended up at like on the campus of Princeton University in 2004. Um, I went to teach the, it was a program, Junior State of America. Um, these guys have taught it a lot. Like you, you guys have done it many, many years, right? Like 20 years or something? I did for, yeah, I mean, I just stopped recently. I mean, I had whittled off and had only done like a week with the island students for a while, but um, yeah, Charlton started before me and quit before I quit. And then I sort of stayed on a few years after. Okay. Not, but yeah, a dozen years or so for each of yeah, us. So I just did it the one year, but um, it was a really great experience and I got to know these guys. And then for whatever reason, we kept kind of bumping into each other through the years, various research projects and mutual friends and, um, they were in Springfield a time or two working on some research projects and um, um, and then when my wife and I were on our journey around the country last time I think I saw you Stephen was with your family at that restaurant what's the name of it down Bar the Louis. At Bar yeah. Louis yeah. Bar Louis. yeah and the last time I saw Charlton was uh, having a drink at building on block in Brooklyn Right, just down the street. Bill, yeah. Building on Bond, which uh, bond. Yeah, sadly yeah. is no longer uh, casualty, yeah. huh? Yeah, mm -hmm. casualty of, of COVID. Pandemic. Yeah. So where are you and Ethan Hawke going to hang out now? <laughs> I don't know. I guess we're just going to go over to his place and uh, hang out in and the party pad. Sure. Yeah, that's, that's, that's Charlton's big name drop. He lives next door to Ethan Hawke. Or on He'll have door. more. He'll have more. Yeah, <laughs> right, right around the block. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, so, but these guys have been writing about, speaking about, researching uh, kind of the intersection of race and politics for a long time. Um, Stephen is a, a political science professor and dean at North Central College, just outside Chicago. Um, and he's written a number of, both of them have written a bunch of books. I'm not going to like run through their CV and give you all their uh, titles. They've all written a bunch of books. Stephen uh, regularly commentates on uh, Chicagoland television about political uh, things when there's debates and, and campaigns and elections and that sort of thing coming up, which I'm sure you have uh, some appearances. 
yep. coming up that'll yep, there's a busy couple of weeks coming up that's for sure mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. um and as some of you that were here earlier heard um there they have a co i guess didn't you both were you both editors on the yes. uh, race and ethnicity second volume a, a large uh, edited volume of pieces on race and ethnicity that the second edition is just being released um like trucks are delivering them to houses. All, big all big trucks. I big was going to say, you're, you're really optimistic. <laughs> yeah. I think bicycles uh, maybe might be delivering a few of them. <laughs> Charlton uh, is a communication professor and a dean at NYU in New York, New York, the city that's so great they named it twice. Um, and uh, also author, I think last time I saw you, you were just going to press with black software. Uh, that's sort of a treatment of race and technology, which is fascinating. Sold um, more, that book sold more copies than all of my other books put together. <laughs> <laughs> Much more engaged. Yeah, there you go. Um, so anyway, I asked these guys to come and, and talk. We've been talking about race issues the last uh, couple of weeks or so. And... Uh, um, so I want to remind you all that as, um, let me get the chat function set up here. So as things go along, you are welcome to just unmute and jump in and interrupt us because I think we're all pretty okay with that. Yes. Um, but also if you, if you want to throw something up on the chat there on the side and then um, as we notice those, we'll, we can jump into those uh, and respond to them as well. So. Um, so, uh, so at, be thinking about questions or comments that you want to throw into the mix, but I want to start out by, let's talk about what is racism? Yeah, I mean, have, um, I, don't, I won't, we won't throw it back to you, but I'm just curious, have you talked about that question with other speakers yet? Or in, in some of the readings I think you've done has maybe gotten a little bit at that question. Yeah, I don't think we've like explicitly addressed that with, because we've kind of just jumped into, like last week we talked to the president of the local NAACP and we kind of just jumped into local issues. And then the week before we had Robbie Jones from PRRI. And so we were talking about you know, white supremacy and religion and uh, that his books, his new book that just came out. And uh, um, so we, we haven't really, I think you all are probably uh, maybe better equipped and maybe uh, um, I was thinking more in terms of you all sort of generally sure. addressing kind of sure. broader race issues. So. Yeah, I mean, I think we probably would agree that the dictionary definition does not suffice and in fi- fact is quite problematic. But, um, there are levels uh, or there, there are different types of racism. We think about interpersonal racism, but more and more, uh, I think in the popular um, d- d- discourse, we're talking about systemic racism. Sometimes we call it um, uh, institutional racism. Um, th- that really, I think it was Beverly Daniel Tatum once defined racism as prejudice plus power. So, so apart from the, this notion of judging people by the color of their skin, which is pretty much what you'd get if you open up Merriam Webster and say what, what, what racism is, um, it's insufficient because it doesn't take into account the power dynamic, which globally and, and throughout time has been an important part of why people have been judged on the color of their skin and what, and what the result has been of people being judged uh, by the color of their skin. And so it, if we don't do that, that it equates any kind of individual level prejudice somebody might have about somebody else's skin color. And that's really not what we're talking about when we're talking about yeah. racism. Charlton, clean that up for me, what I do. <clears throat> well, <laughs> I mean, I think the, the, the most important of this part of this framework is, at least in my view, the removal of the individual. I almost always refuse to talk about racism in the context of individual person's actions, because I think that that's where so often this debate or questions about racism get stymied because as soon as you say something about uh, something being racist, that's automatically internalized, um, particularly by, white folks 
and it's about me and it's about my motivations and um, my beliefs, which may or may not be aligned with some of those things that, that Stephen mentioned in terms of that dictionary and uh, relationships to think about prejudice and, and so forth. So, so I think that what's most important is in part defining what it is not in order to be able to, to, to recognize the, the, both the systemic and institutional framework of racism, which, you know, as you said, really is about prejudice plus power. So if you think back to a time where the prejudices that we associate with, with folks typically who are non-white <clears throat> that were um, almost singularly uh, negative, right? Um, so let's just not think about it in the present day, but think about it, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, um, what those prejudices and associations were. Now, then think about a, an institution, let's say um, uh, the institution of uh, um, the courts and law enforcement, the ways in which that institution has been able to to act and reinforce those prejudices in ways that um, uh, produce varying outcomes that are based on race and meaning that they produce advantages and disadvantage, uh, disadvantages that accrue to certain groups of people based on race. And so if you think about that and think about this historically, bring it forward, to think about the institutions irrespective of any individual and think about the ways that institutions work and produce policy or their normal business operations that then produce advantages and disadvantages based on racial lines and seeing the outcomes of that rather than thinking about the source or the motivation of any individual in that um, system. Mm -hmm. So the, so the idea of systems is so important, but it's a really slippery thing to grasp. I mean, you, you really, it's, it's a hard thing to explain. You know, this is the reason why I think the news media is so inefficient or, or ineffective, mm -hmm. is probably better, in helping people understand systemic racism, because you've got to understand the notion of symptoms, systems. And you also have to understand that individual behaviors, thoughts, attitudes are constrained by culture broadly and systems. If you're not willing to accept that reality, um, then it's going to get exactly to what Charlton said about the individual level. It's just like, as long as I'm not mean to people based on the color of their skin, as long as I, this is where you get the, I got black friends thing. So I can't possibly be racist. Uh, <laughs> if you don't understand those broader context, context where it's systems, how they operate, none of this is going to make any sense. And it takes a long time, I think, to internalize that because we've been taught from a very early age in the United States in particular, but Western culture generally, that individualism is most important, that you can overcome whatever barriers are thrown your way because it's, this is sort of the liberal mentality. I don't mean liberal, like liberal conservative, but I'm talking about the classical Absolutely. liberal mentality, the individual is most important. And so that, you know, we have to undo some of that mindset to understand how that while that's not untrue, it is constrained by parameters and examining those parameters is an important part of what we try to do. So talk a little bit um, in terms of like examples. Uh, we talked about systemic racism, I think it was last week. Um, like specifically, we spent some time on white privilege and systemic racism. And I'm interested in you all addressing like what, what would you see as kind of like primary examples of systemic racism? Like, so when you're, when you, there's that argument that floats around these days, like systemic racism isn't real, right? That it yeah, yeah it's hard to see, right? It's hard not to a thing, right? Because you can't just point to it. You yeah. really easily and tangibly prove it. You can't separate it out as an entity and go, here it is. And um, so like, how do you respond to, to those sorts of questions? See, do you mind if I give it a, give it a yeah. try? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, that, the, the one, th I'll give you a concrete example, but let me, let me set it up first, if you don't mind. So give me a second. So if you think about um, the interrelationship between so many of our institutions as a cycle, um, and you can start it anywhere you want, but let's talk about schools, right? Because we hear a lot of times schools are the great equalizer. If you have great schools, then you can succeed. Even if you were born poor, it doesn't matter your race, whatever. Okay, so that's good. So let's think about how the public school system works, though. The public school systems are guaranteed to everybody. In fact, they're mandated, right, through 12th grade you know, with few exceptions, um, 
but they are, we know that all schools are not equal in terms of their quality and, and in terms of their funding. And part of the reason they're not equal in terms of quality and funding is because we disproportionately, not wholly, but disproportionately fund public schools through property taxes in the United States. That's yeah, just as a sidebar, I've, I've spent time at debate tournaments on the North Shore of Chicago uh, and these schools that Nice oh to your college, yeah. Oh my. <laughs> like, yeah, we were, we were, I think it was uh, uh, Glenbrook North or something like that, and they were built, this was 25 years ago, they were building a $25 million field house. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, like, yeah. and this is a high school. Yeah. <laughs> so. My kids go to Chicago Public School in a neighborhood. That's not, yeah. that's <laughs> not, that, not that neighborhood, I can promise you. Uh, so wh- where you live, is very much related to the quality of the schools that children will go to, right? And everybody lives in the nicest place they can, right? Nobody chooses to live, right? You you live in the best place, the safest place you can, the place with the most amenities you can, without going broke, right? But with what you can afford, you would live in the the neighborhood um, that, that will bring you prosperity and bring you happiness. And so because we know then that housing patterns are not are not immune from race, you know, dating back to redlining and other practices, but also simply because of economics. And we know that economics is disproportionately black and brown in the United States. It is fine. It doesn't mean that all people who are poor are black or brown. It means that black or brown people as a, as a group have a higher proportion of poverty than white people as a group. So what does that mean? It means that how do I get to live in a better neighborhood so my kids can go to better schools where I should make more money? Well, how do you get to make more money? Well, it's usually for most of us, we make money because of the job we have. Some of us make money because of investments, but we're talking about a whole nother thing there. Yeah. But in terms of the folks that are, the, the money that you bring in on a regular basis dictates how much money you have, which dictates where you can live, which dictates how your kids' schools are gonna be. And you mostly get those jobs because of access to college. And how do you get into a good college and be prepared to succeed well in college? Because of the high school you went to, right? Which is related to where you live. So you can see how that cycle works. All right, so let's just take, and you, and so we could do this all night long and take different pieces of that cycle, but let's just take that education piece for a second. Let's imagine a student who's in an inner city school that's underfunded because the property values in that city, in her neighborhood, uh, and citywide are not as high as the suburbs that, that the professor just described, right, and with the big $25 million sports complex. Um, let's say that student ends up, is the best student, and graduates first in her class, she has a 4.0 GPA, uh, and so she applies to college with her transcript, 4.0 GPA. Well, that kid from Glenbard North might have a 4.4 GPA. How do they do that? Well, they have advanced placement classes. Mm-hmm. It's expensive to have advanced placement classes. Only the best schools have advanced placement classes, right? I'm not, not the, I don't mean the best schools, like elite schools. I'm just saying that you have to have enough money in your school to have it. So she did everything she was supposed to do, but she couldn't possibly compare on paper if everything else was equal, her GPA is four tenths of a point lower than that other student who also did everything that they were supposed to do. Mm-hmm. So she didn't do anything wrong. No teacher bias was biased against her because of the color of her skin or her, or her economic condition. There, there were constraints of her situation that didn't allow her to compete on a merit basis. So when we say, well, look, just put the pieces of paper down. Whoever has the best scores, they should get into college. That seems fair only if you believe that everybody had the same chance to get those same scores, right? Mm-hmm. And we haven't even talked about the SATs. <laughs> I was right. only talking about GPA. That's only one board. Who was better prepared for? And even if they got in, who's prepared to succeed in college? What kind of infrastructure was there in high school to teach them how to be to do well in college, not just to get in, right? Getting in's only part. They don't give you degrees for getting in. You only get, you only get in and then you got to earn the degree, right? So anyway, I'll stop there. That's one sort of example. And then... As usual, I'll let Charlton fix whatever I messed up. <laughs> I don't know about fix, but um, that's a, a sort of a, a different um, scenario that is uh, sort of on the same basis around kind of location, geography, et cetera, which I think for me, doing a lot of work in this area around um, housing and space and so forth, which has been kind of the foundation for a lot of racial inequality, institutional systemic racism uh, in the US. Um, So I'm remembering back um, uh, a number of years ago now, probably seven, eight, nine years ago, um, when the New York Times had come out with uh, a set of really engaging um, maps um, where they had then overlaid a whole bunch of data about neighborhoods and census tracts and sort of down to the block um, data. 
Um, yeah. And you could sort of go in and engage and ask different questions based on data around income and um, wealth and people's business practices and race and uh, all these kinds of details. So I, I did a little experiment in one of my courses that I was teaching on called race and media. And, you know, as is typically the case in one of my, my, my courses, you know, my students are overwhelmingly on the liberal end of the political spectrum and um, identify as Democrats and so forth. So this kind of experiment worked beautifully because I wanted to sort of destabilize in a way much of their motivations and trying to think about this, um, you know, individual aspect of motivation and thinking about race and prejudice and so forth and how that is distinct from systems and structures. So what I did was something like this. I had them get in groups. I had them talk a little bit about, uh, you know, a, a, a future 10 years in the, in, the, in the future when they were going to be in a position to buy a, a home. Um, and so they're looking around for homes um, and they had to ask themselves what things were most important in driving their decision about where to live, where to choose to buy a home. Um, and so they had a number of things to choose from. Long story short, almost all of them um, <clears throat> chose a couple of things that were uh, very high. Number one, quality of schools very close to that, something about uh, racial diversity. So wanting to live in a place that was racially diverse in terms of their neighbors, but also the kids going to schools that would be um, in the neighborhoods where they would choose. So there are a whole lot of other factors that I asked them then to say, rearrange all these into a priority level. Then once you made your choice, we're gonna then map out where the outcomes of your choice uh, give you in terms of your opportunity of where you can buy a home. Mm -hmm. um, and in every single case, the priority choices led them to a neighborhood that was, I think, at the very uh, least about 97% white. <laughs> at the least. And it blew their, I, I mean, literally, I had students crying and emailing me back saying, I never quite realized that. And they got what I meant, which was you can have all of the attentions in the world in terms of value of diversity and anti-racism and so forth. But a lot of this comes down to choices that are hard and they're hard because they are structural in nature, meaning the structure of the way we do schooling, education, the way that we provide opportunities to uh, own a home, all of things, all of those things are set up very specifically in ways that disadvantage and make it very unlikely for that to be equitable mm -hmm. uh, on a, along racial lines. Um, so that's one of those examples I use often to sort of get a sense of what structure looks like we could talk about many more i think you know the whole i think it, let me let me add i think because there's i'm sure there's folks in the room this is always the case at, at, at my college anyway we grew up in in, in small towns in, in um, southern illinois for instance that are overwhelmingly white but also very poor and got to be thinking my class i didn't have any ap classes either right and so my you know i think about that my kids school is 25 percent white but it's a very middle class school in downtown chicago if I really wanted them to go to school with kids who were poorer, who came from, you know, have a more diverse mix socioeconomically, I could just move 25 blocks south, but it wouldn't be safe. Mm -hmm. It's not a safe neighborhood 25 blocks south, right? And so I'm not going to make that choice because of my, exactly to Charlton's point on my priorities, to move my kids into a neighborhood where I might not feel comfortable coming home at nine o'clock at night or having them come home uh, late. So I, I think that it, we have to think about both of those things, which is choices we make and also that you know, if you grew up in a small town, that wasn't a choice you made to grow up in that small town, right? And it wasn't your choice to live in a town that wasn't more diverse. That's the town you grew up in, right? And there's poverty there too. The question is, what are the what are the likelihood though of a white person living in poverty compared to a black or brown person living in poverty? And when we realize what those statistics are, that cycle that I just described helps 
to mm. understand it. It's hard to get out of that cycle now, in both directions. If you're rich, it's also hard to fall out of it. I always tell my students, mm -hmm. heroin is one way. You know what I mean? If you really want to screw it up, you were born rich and you had all the privileges. <laughs> Heroin's one way to screw it up, but there's not a lot of ways to get out of that. You, you know, you're going to end up because you're going to get bailed out. You do, you get caught with a DUI. Somebody's going to hire an expensive lawyer that's going to get that expunged, so it's not going to affect your chance to get to college in a way that a poor kid is not. And if you're born poor, of course, it's hard. To, of course, you can pick stories. We're going to pick the kid who dropped out of high school and then invented a great tech thing or who who became, you know, got out from some other way. But those stories are, those are anomalies. And we use them to reinforce sort of the notion of American meritocracy. Mm -hmm. But they but they belie the trends, right? And really what you want is a trend where everybody has an opportunity. It doesn't mean everybody has to succeed, but everybody has a chance, a real, you know, a ch close to the same, close to the same chance as possible right. to succeed. Is, is, so is part of our curse in a, uh, the race problems in America, this, uh, our history of individualism, because trying, like just having this conversation about these kinds of, these sort of systemic institutionalized issues, it's really difficult to have this conversation without people starting to sort of transport, transport that over to, but what about me? And I, I you know, and these feelings, the, the cognitive dissonance that they feel, uh, because they feel like they're, they're, they're supposed to own that and, and be responsible for those problems. And uh, I find it so difficult to have the conversations about systemic racism without people sort of taking it very personally um, and sort of adopting the, this sort of need to justify themselves. Because uh, it seems like above all, people just want to make sure that they're not racist, right? That they're not seen as or called racist. Um, and, uh, I, I, I wonder if you've thought about or have come up with ways that we kind of get past that. I, I can't imagine that you have, but, uh, Oh, we but, got all the answers. We got all the yeah. answers, man. And given the fee you're paying us, we are ready to deliver those answers tonight. This is the, it's a big night for everybody. Yeah. Uh, but I here. actually think in all seriousness, it's kind of what Charlton started with is this sort of trying to, to think beyond the individualistic. Mm -hmm. And it's a, not an easy thing to do, um, as you noted. But you know, it, here's a small thing that's a language thing, which, which is, should be good for everybody in this class. Um, you know, if, you, if you really pay attention to people who write a lot about race, who think about race, who research race, you almost never see them, us, use the word racist as a noun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't call a person a racist, because that defines your entire being then. Right? That was a racist thought. There was a racist thing you said, racist as an adjective, right? Describing the things you did, the things you said, the things, your ideas are racist. Because as soon as you say you're a racist because you said that thing, well, of course you're going to get defensive. Because let me tell you about all the things I did that weren't racist today. You know what I mean? I spent most of my day not being racist, right? Um, and so, so I think that helps a little bit. If we get the language straight to say, you know, I was raised in a racist culture in a racist country that was built on white supremacy. And as a result, no matter what my intentions are, I've absorbed that and it affects my daily thinking, my daily behaviors. And I can spend time, as I do, trying to push against it, but it doesn't erase it, right? I don't get, I don't have a, Charlton will be the first to tell you, I don't get a pass because of 20 years of race research that all of a sudden I'm not racist. I would never say I'm not racist. I would right. never say that. And here I am with my name on all kinds of books about race and advocating for dismantling white supremacy. Like that's my thing, but that doesn't mean that I'm immune from it. And I think if we can accept that without shame and understand that that's not our fault. The fault is that if, you, if, you, if it's pointed out to you and you start to understand it and you still choose to not work on it, well, that's a different thing. I still wouldn't call you a racist, but, we, but we're gonna have some static. Yeah, so that kind of gets to this question of like, um, but I think we oversimplify because we like the labeling and the, the polar, like polarization cells, right? So, yeah. um, but I think we like to, to ask the question like, are, are, can white people, are all white people in the U.S. racist? Well, and I think you've answered that uh, to a certain extent. I think that there's no value in, in assigning that identity. There's a difference between, between systems and behaviors and, and attributes and an identity like we're not assigning someone the identity of, of racist but um but can i just interrupt i would just say yeah. i wouldn't just limit it to white people 
If you right. were raised in a racist culture, you've absorbed notions of racism, not just white people, right. right? And it doesn't mean that black people hate themselves, literally, or hate other black. It means that you've absorbed norms that are mm -hmm. consistent with white supremacy because they're pervasive. Mm -hmm. And we may differentiate in terms of how much we work against them. And it certainly is the case that people who aren't white have more motivation to do so because their livelihood is at stake. Their very lives are at stake as a result in a way that mine is not and my child's is not. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that they haven't internalized right. some of that cultural pressure. Right. Um, I have lots of other things I can raise, but does anybody have any, any comments or questions? My office is cold all of a sudden. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Ghosts came through here for a second. Yeah. Well, I figured you'd be heating up because you're... Yeah, you're, yeah, yeah, you would think so. <laughs> yeah, <reaching> up, so. <laughs> Anybody? Questions? Comments? How's that sitting with all of you? I mean, did, did, did either one of us say anything to make you mad yet? I mean, we're not trying to make you mad, but we understand that if, if you haven't thought a lot about this or haven't had a chance to engage with it, it's... I mean, I can remember... I can remember... I mean, I don't remember a moment, but I remember a moment in time where I realized I was... I'm first-generation college student. My parents didn't go to college at all. Um, I didn't grow up poor, but I mean, I grew up, I mean, we never took vacations. My parents didn't get vacation time. We didn't have any extra money. Everything we went was to the house. Yeah, I didn't get Nikes. I had to get the shoes from the Sears and all that kind of stuff, right? So I wasn't like poor, but I didn't have a lot. And I got to be a professor and I got to be a, a PhD and I, I'm a dean now. But w w that moment in time when I realized I didn't just earn all of that, you know, it wasn't just that I, I just, I, because I don't know when my parents did not get denied for a loan because they happened to be white and therefore could move into a, a neighborhood that would put me in a school that would set me up for college better. I don't know when I didn't get turned away or, or given the benefit of the doubt or wasn't accused of doing something that I didn't do because I was white. I don't, you know, I don't know when those places were, but I have to acknowledge that I didn't just make it on my own. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, that's an uncomfortable thing to acknowledge because of exactly what the professor just said, which is we have this notion of individualism that we value very much. That's what America is supposed to be about. Anybody can make it. If you work hard, you play by the rules. And I did all those things. I did work hard. I did play by the rules. But I also probably got some help that I can't identify. I, don't, I can't tell you exactly when it was. But I know for sure that I never got harmed as a result of the color yeah, of my that's the, like you, you, At the very least, you know that, that you weren't harmed because of your race. Like, you, you weren't denied opportunity because of your race. Which, which, which is an interesting, uh, you know, I, I won't purposely make you mad, but I do like to poke around a little bit. Um, and <laughs> um, and, and I, I think you uh, mentioned that uh, you all had re uh, either read portions of all of uh, the uh, white fragility book. Oh, Angela, yeah. I think they saw a speech and read some stuff that Robin D'Angelo wrote, yeah. Which, which is a book I will frankly admit to you that I've never read and because I've refused to read it. I read it. I'm white. I had to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're supposed to. You're supposed to. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, I, you know, I think the, you know, when I'm, when I'm around folks of, of color, the, the conversation in a book like that is, you know, I think shows a flip side of what, uh, what, what Stephen and Brett have both kind of mentioned, which is, you know, this notion of fragility or, you know, that the, the thought of being thought of as a racist, as the most painful thing that I just cannot get over. <laughs> and it's sort of like, really? Yeah. <laughs> that must be nice, huh? That, there, there's privilege. That's the, bad that's, word. that's the worst? Yeah. All right, all right. Um, but I, you know, I, I do, I still think though that that is, it's part of, at least for me, part of the, what gets, what gets in the way. Because in that scenario, something about the individual is still front and center. And it is, this is about me and this is about my relationship to this particular issue. And I have to make you see me more than anything else and my ability to sort of put my best face forward mm -hmm. uh, as not mm -hmm. you know this is what ends up being kind of primary mm -hmm. um, and I think that is what what stymies so much of the conversation of folks who would say like look uh, you know 
I could care less about either of you individually, and I will just take it on face value that you don't have a racist bone in your body, and yet more black and brown people than white folks um, are disproportionately locked up, are disproportionately unable to gain advantages to college or to uh, uh, other forms of higher education or employment or um, home ownership or all of these things in very system systematic ways. And so it's like, let's yeah, but they didn't just- get called racist, But they didn't get called racist. Yeah. That, that all yeah. sounds bad. All those things you said sounds bad, but it's not as bad as getting called racist. Hell yeah. <laughs> not even not even close. <laughs> so like I, I'm interested in your thoughts then on the on the I mean I, I guess it's not a new idea, but I think we're it there's new sort of public attention to the concept of anti racism because it seems everybody's super motivated to not be seen as a racist, but then you have people like, you know, Ibram X. Kendi saying it's it's not enough to just not be a racist. You're either like sort of de facto supporting a racist structure or you're working against it. There's not a neutral ground. Yeah, I mean, you're right in the sense that you, you say uh, that it's not new. I mean, I think we've had, um, I mean, for, for a long time, we, we, I mean, I think in the 1960s, late 1960s, early 1970s. Malcolm X, I think, was saying those things for sure. Yeah, in the midst of the movement, that, you know, to say, to say, for instance, you know, you can't be, you can't stand still on a moving train, right? And so it's just avoiding mm -hmm. being overtly prejudiced. It's not just it's not enough. But the silence is complicity. The silence allows it to continue, that, that there's a responsibility that white folks in particular have to disrupt cycles and to help raise consciousness. Once you know, I used to say to students, you know, that the, 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 the metaphor, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. You know, once you realize how real this is, even though it's complicated, first step is you get mad that you weren't taught this earlier. You, weren't, you get mad that you, you didn't understand its complexity earlier. And then you feel helpless because you're one little person. And it's not now, now fixing racism isn't what your parents told you, which is be nice to people. Don't judge them by the color of their skin. Once you realize that's not, that's not your part anymore, it feels really disempowering. Mm -hmm. Because now your responsibility is to undo a system that was designed to keep white people in a better position than non-white people. Mm -hmm. And if you benefit by that, even though it's not your fault, you feel like you have some responsibility then to dismantle that system. Everybody does it, but, but many, many people do and more people do. And I think that's really where the, the notion of anti-racism work comes in. And think about this back to the example I mentioned earlier. And this is, this is a, a, a hard and difficult choice. And I'll tell you, you know, how we made the choice for, for my uh, uh, family, but let's take the, the housing situation again, right? So you recognize being in a district um, where I am when I moved to, to Brooklyn and we live in a place where the two public schools near us that we're zoned for <clears throat> um, are not great. And yet they are adjacent to neighborhoods that are probably the highest socioeconomic neighborhoods in Brooklyn and in the country, right? So the, the, the setup you have is a group of 30, 40, 50% of parents who are very affluent um, in a district where the public schools are not great. So what's the choice that you have? Mm -hmm. Where am I gonna send my kid, right? And this I think is where the idea of uh, anti-racism comes into play because that's the nexus of the choice, right? Mm -hmm. the, the choice to say, there's a private school down the road and I'm gonna send my, my kids there because I can guarantee that they will get what I think that they deserve to get. Or do I send my kid to these to this public school? Do I marshal the other families like me in the neighborhood to send their kids there as well? Do we provide, let's say, uh, as many schools do, the extra funding that bridges the gap between what the school provides in terms of resources 
with what the parents do and elevate the ability of that school and all the students that go to that school then to have certain levels of achievement. Mm -hmm. That's not well, a... Well, and, and, and you, as you know, because uh, you're going to, I'm going to interrupt you so that they have to wait longer, <laughs> so they have to wait longer to find out what your family to, chose to do. But if you, uh, it, it, I don't know if, if you have talked about the, the podcast that came out earlier in the year called Nice White Parents. It's from the same people that made Serial. Uh, but it is worth listening to, and it takes place in New York, and it's exactly this situation, is that it, it's, Charlton's not white, but it is middle-class parents, right, who decide to send their kids, they all decide as a cluster to do it, to raise extra money, and then you can imagine what happens, they end up taking over the whole school. Right? <laughs> and, and, and then they see segregation within the school mm -hmm. of certain programs. I mean, it is an amazing, it's, 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 um, it's, uh, it's only a four, I think it's a four or five part series, so it's not a long one, but it's nice white parents. I highly recommend it, but. I've, um, I've seen it and it's kind of in my queue, but yeah. I, I definitely will check it out. Okay, so now I bought some time. Let's, <laughs> drum, roll, drum roll, please. What did the McElwain decide? <laughs> um, <laughs> We sent my son to private school, right? <laughs> yep. um, I mean, for many, for many reasons. Um, but part of it was, and it was a very deliberate discussion, you know, it's the question of, well, what about my kid? And that's what it always comes down to. What about my kid and my family? And I think that's then where the disruption is. And you have to make a choice either about that or what the alternative path is moving forward. And so this, this podcast, is that flip side all right so what then the dynamics if i choose the yes. other yes and what tensions will that instigate and how will that play out and does that play out as all right the 50 percent um white middle class or rich folks have come over now we're going to show all of you non-white folks how this is done yes it's colonial and <laughs> it's cool i mean right it's just right out of yeah. and, and so you can you can colonial see mindset how for one way or another, the easiest thing to do, if I have the means to do so, is say there is a nice private school down the road, this is what's, what's happening. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, it really, I wasn't trying to be overly literary, but it is Kurtz on the boat, going down yeah, the river, right. right out of heart of darkness, right? This notion yep. is we will, the savages, and we will come, and we'll teach them the ways, and, and honestly, of course, nobody's thinking about that literally, but that, but that is, ends up what, what ha what's happening. Can I tell a quick story that's on this uh, similar point? So Chicago, the Chicago public school system is, is um, not only like every big city segregated and, and uh, f f the funding is in proportion and all the things that, that you know, but it's also, you know, the documentary Waiting for Superman was about, was about Chicago public schools because there's like lottery systems to get into the better schools. And, mm -hmm. and, but there's also merit system to get into some of the better high schools. So you can go to your neighborhood schools to eighth grade and then you apply to get into these selective enrollment high schools because, but you have to have great scores and then they hold some seats available. There's magnet schools and there's a lottery, whatever. Okay, well, I'm just gonna tell you a story about somebody I know who it, thinks their family is as liberal as you can get. And this is what happens, right? You think you're as liberal as you can get. This is what they did. Okay, so the way that the slot, the seats are allocated to get into the high schools for ninth grade, the selective enrollment high schools, is that they're on a quartile system, which means that each entering class has one fourth of the of the in incoming class come from each of the four zip codes arranged by income. Okay, so in other words, each one will have approximately 25% of kids from the poorest neighborhoods, 25% of kids from the richest neighborhoods, and then 25 from each of the other two neighborhoods, right? You follow me? Okay, this family, I shit you not, when their kid, their oldest kid was in sixth grade, moved two blocks over <laughs> to get into a lower, where the boundary was, where a low, so it still wasn't a bad neighborhood, it was still a good neighborhood, but it was on the edge of the neighborhood where the boundary was drawn just so they could get into the lower one lower uh, quartile so they had a, and it didn't guarantee their kid to get in it just get, guaranteed their kid that were competing with a different set of kids to get in right and i pointed out to this person you took a seat from a poorer kid right because only so many kids i mean they didn't see it like that they saw it as just maximizing their chances but right. it's like X number of kids were getting in from that, that quartile. It wasn't the lowest one, by the way. It was the second one, right? X number of kids were getting in from that one. 
Now one fewer of those kids who legitimately live in that neighborhood are getting in because your kid has a better, and that kid got in, got in. Mm. And, but these are very nice white parents, right? These are very progressive people and want to get, want to live in the city and want to, but not as Charlton pointed out, not if it affects my kid. Right. Do what I can. Yeah. And I think Jill's point that she's made in the chat there is that it is something that um, yes, sure. obviously some people are thinking about to game the system. Um, but most people probably just aren't like, it's not something that occurs to them. They're not really thinking, or they are thinking about it, but they're not thinking about the ramifications of it. They're not thinking about the full, uh, nature of it. And then Catherine says to address diversity and equity within schools. Is that also how busing can come into play? I remember the This American Life did a special on some of the St. Louis schools and how busing helped and then taking it away stripped students of access to schools. I think it was specifically Michael Brown school. Oh yeah, in Ferguson. In Ferguson, yeah. yeah in Ferguson. St. Louis is interesting because St. Louis, I lived in St. Louis from 98 to 2001. And while I lived there is when finally the federal decision on the desegregate on the bus desegregation case was finished. Like 1999, right? Yeah. I mean, Brown versus Board was 1954 and they hadn't solved it yet until 19, it was, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, busing is a whole nother, right? And it, it's sort of well-meaning, but people can get around. The thing is that people, when they have power, can get around whatever system you put in place. Mm -hmm. This is it, right? That's why it's not about individual people so much as systems. We shouldn't expect people to send their kids to a worse school than they could send them to, to help society. That's asking a lot, right? That's asking a lot. Why should they do that? Mm -hmm. We shouldn't ask that of anybody. Mm -hmm. The question is, why should any school be so bad that you wouldn't want to send your kid to it? Right. Isn't that a better question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm not trying to wrap things up, but I want you to, uh, if you all could sort of respond to one of the things we've kind of, just because the nature of the world we live in these days has kind of forced us to talk a lot about polarization, um, this kind of divisiveness that we uh, are facing in the culture and um, thoughts on how we address, like uh, specifically I'm interested in, do you see our, our, our responses to polarization and divisiveness as primarily systemic or primarily like personal rhetorical? Um, does it start on this kind of personal cultural level or does it need to start or does it, does it have to be one or the other? I like the chicken and egg. I like the way you yeah. do Charlton, you wanted to start first? I mean, I think it's a little of both. And I, here's how I answer that question. And it's with my, um, uh, I'll, I'll go back to my 14 years living in Oklahoma, which is probably 13 too long. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, yeah. I'm trying to think of how to describe it. So I, Part of this had to do with, you know, my upbringing and so forth, but I think it's, it, it's instructive. The one thing I like to say about living in Oklahoma was that, you know, everything was out on the table and in the open for the most part in terms of, of race. You know, I can remember on many, 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 many different occasions, uh, I can tell you many stories of being, you know, uh, from being in a bar to being at a, a political rally or conference or something like that. And, um, you know, people quite open about, you know, their thoughts about black people and, you know, and sort of using those, using very colorful words and language and so forth. And, um, but always to the consequence that we're still getting the next beer, right? And we're still talking and, um, and so I think in some way that, personal level has to to be there and there's a sense in which thinking about just the ability to communicate if that's not there you end up of course with this kind of polarization which is just I cannot talk to you if you have any kind of uh, viewpoint that's different from mine or upbringing um, and that not having some boundaries I mean clearly there are people that I I wouldn't talk to or wouldn't choose to, but um, but I think that is is fairly um, broad. I think that then goes to the the 
the structural part when you know there is some kind of call to action as it were meaning i think there has to be a way in which we can bridge the gap in terms of conversation and interaction and communication being able to talk to people right knowing that you and i see completely differently on all things perhaps but we can still talk about things that are of interest or in common to to both of us i think then the next level comes in how to deal with that i don't know systemic structural action part mm -hmm. and and i'll say that one of the most frustrating things let's say about uh the the 2016 election um was finding so many of these people that i had invested time in over the years um either friends or acquaintances of some time all of that sort of capital that we put into building relationships seemed to fall off when there was no recognition about the outcome of the election or not just the outcome of the election, but the way in which the election happened and particularly some of the, the, um, the outcomes accruing to uh, people of color and so forth and the way and the rhetoric that uh, helped to make that happen. And so the inability of people to move and acknowledge certain things about the world, you know, makes for, I think, then a little bit more of that, that uh, sort of polarization. So I guess my long-winded answer is to say it, it takes both. And I think sometimes having that relationship helps, but also it becomes a kind of, for me, the dividing line. If there's never a sense in which you will ever see anything differently or be willing to act differently, then I think that becomes a, a wedge at that point. Where yeah, I, think, I was just, a, I was ready to disagree with you through the whole thing until the end. <laughs> <laughs> because not, not fundamentally disagree, because I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the rhetoric that I'm seeing that centers on problematizing us in it, being it not, not able to talk to each other through this yeah because, because of what you just said at the very end charlton which is i think we all have to have our lines you know yeah. and maybe we're drawing them in the wrong place and i'm certainly open to that conversation but my line is if you're not trying to learn anything right if you're not interested in learning anything because i am i'm always mm -hmm. interested in learning and if you're willing to deny the essential humanity of anyone mm -hmm. i'm not having i'm not i'm not going right. any further that, that, you know what I mean? Like, I don't think, I don't think there needs to be space for that. Um, and so, and I know that people can disagree with that. They say, well, you just talk to everybody anyway. I just think at some point, if you're not trying and you're denying someone's humanity, that is not denying them, you know, some policy preference, <laughs> like about their fundamental humanity. Mm -hmm. And that's the value level that we, you know, values are the deepest, are the, are the deepest level of thought, right? I mean, these are the things that we should be able to agree upon in principle, even if we don't agree about exactly what it looks like or how we get there. Mm -hmm. And I think once you're willing to deny a person's humanity, yep. um, I don't think I can have a conversation. I don't think there's anything beneficial that can come out of it. And maybe other people have different lines and aren't willing to talk to me if I'm yep. not willing to put country over ideas or I'm not, I mean, I can imagine what some of those things would be. Yeah, yeah I think disrespect our troops and kneel for the flag. There's nothing you know, but I would say it's a fundamental misunderstanding about what kneeling for the flag is about. It has nothing to do with disrespecting the troops. But if that, but for some people, that's a line. But if that's where you are, disrespect the troops, we can't even talk. Right. So I think it spirals then, and now we get to the point where we're all drawing lines in different places, so then we're not talking to each other. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's the, the conversation that people, those of us who study communication in particular, should be having yes. because... I think we're going to be in the next couple months or so, we're going to be facing these kinds of personal crises like things are going to get crazy there's just no question of that right mm -hmm. um and how am i going to like what's my personal ethic going to be in this situation like what's my plan and that plan might get you know thrown out the window uh because you don't know for sure what's going to happen but 
uh, giving, and I've been, I've been struggling with this a lot about like, where are, where is my line or what are my lines? Um, because, you know, there are going to be some lines where I, I can't just, I can't do it. Like I can't have that conversation. When you're the foremost expert, I would say, I mean, you, you, you gave, you sold your house, stuck all your stuff in a van <laughs> yeah. and drove around to try to find out why people can't talk to each other. Yeah. And, uh, right. I mean, this is like, talk about walking the walk. Forget that nonsense. It was a nice enough van, but forget that. Forget all that. <laughs> not me. You're not getting me in that van. Yeah. Would have been. It would have been cool if I could have gotten you in the. Well, van. I guess for yeah, I would drive around blocking the baby, but I, 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 I want a shower, hot shower every single day. We had, we have a shower in the van, man. <laughs> really, really tiny shower. <laughs> um. So anybody, uh, like I have a a couple of closing things, but uh, anybody have a a thought or? Yeah, we're happy to have questions or. Yeah, just disagreements even is fine. Yeah. I mean, they're used to it. They're they're very comfortable with your disagreements too. If you want to, don't say <laughs> them. Times, yeah, to me. Auditorium, like, don't you... auditorium full of people make it yelling at us. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Don't wait till they're gone and then tell me all the problems you had with what they said. I cannot believe that. <laughs> yeah. If you do that, that's racist. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm totally joking. Oh, only if it's about me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you can be racist toward Italian people too, right? <laughs> I, will, I will say no more on that i know we don't want to hear you i know i'm afraid it's gonna go in a bad place um i guess i can have a question about um oh the systems that essentially need to be corrected like besides the fact that there are almost all of them um i one that i've always focused on is like the prison systems yeah. makes me want to die but the and a lot of that, I mean, some of it's just a basic overcrowding and a problem in itself, but a lot of it, I mean, more than a lot is, is racial. Um, are there any systems that are like kind of on the back burners or that people are actively trying to come up with to correct the, the issues that are clearly here that we're talking about? And I think the one that we don't talk about as often is health, although it's come up during the pandemic because we've seen disproportionate deaths in black and brown communities as a result of, of the coronavirus. But, um, you know, I was just on, we had last Friday a, TED, a TEDx event at North Central College, and I was responsible for leading discussion after uh, David Lammy's talk. David Lammy's a member of parliament um, from, in the UK, and he's talking about the intersection between racism and global climate change. And, um, and it goes in a lot of, it's, it's not one direction. It's, it is true that global climate change is disproportionately harming uh, brown and black people around the world. That's true. But it's also partly a result of a colonial mindset that is white people have the rights to the, the land and the minerals and the, and the richness uh, in, in the global South, right? And so I think that there's, that, that has, you mentioned back burner. I think, you know, I gave you the, the elements that I think are on the front burner earlier, right? Education, housing, employment, right? And we could probably add immigration to that, you know, especially because it's in public salience. But health disparities, I have a whole chapter, I have a separate book on inequality in America. It's a, it's a textbook that's written for an undergraduate audience. And I have a whole separate chapter on health uh, because it's not just health inequality that is a function of racism and poverty but it feeds it as well, right? I mean, if you, you're more likely to go into poverty if you have health concerns that aren't addressed because you don't have proper care, et cetera. Um, you know, we know the pollution is disproportionate in the communities of color, asthma rates are higher, rates of uh, carcinogens in water. I mean, you know, I don't have to give you all the statistics, right? So you're right when you say it's all the systems, right? But, and, but, but the reason that is also is because they're interconnected. It's not that somebody sat down and listed all the systems and say, how can we make this more racist? Let's figure that out, right? It's, it's a system of white supremacy built institutions that all feed off of each other and self-perpetuate. And that's the reason why it's also interconnected. You can't just point to one and go, that one's pretty not racist. You know what I mean? They all are because they're all kind of baked in the same way. What I missed, Charlton? No, I was just gonna say, I think you know, COVID is a perfect yeah. example of that, right? If you start with just the health trigger and you're looking at institutions of health, um, but then look at where that impacts in terms of communities of color, then ask the question about what it is that those communities are doing about education, then you get into the disparities of access to uh, broadband and uh, Wi-Fi technology and so forth, and therefore people are disparately impacted in terms of um, 
who's going to fall off during this moment when education as normal is disrupted, even when it's already started off on a bad track. Um, and then, um, you know, so you can go, as, as, uh, as Stephen said, from institution to institution and see this connectedness that when you start with one, the trigger just goes to each of the other. And I think that's the perfect example when we think about and illustrate systemic racism is that it is across the board, every board, and you cannot point to, you know, there's not one person in a room somewhere going, you know what, I want to make sure that certain people really don't come out of this. Mm -hmm. I will dare say nobody's sitting around a room saying that, although there are probably a few people around in the room saying that. But by and large, no, but it happens, right? And we know and can predict, I mean, there were, at least among the people, a lot of the folks that I hang out with, when the numbers came out about the disparate impact, it wasn't as if anybody was shocked, right? Mm -hmm. This is the way things work time and again with any, uh, trigger or health uh, uh, um, emergency like this. You know who's going to be impacted more or less or to a longer extent. Um, I, I think I might be able to wrap this up in a bow a little bit based on what, because Charlton just said exactly, I think, the most important thing of the whole hour, right? And Because he said there isn't somebody in a room saying, you know, a racist, I want this to impact black people and brown people more. I think that if we start by the interpersonal, that's what we would look for. If you're going to prove to me that COVID is racist, find me the person in the room who, mm -hmm. once we've agreed that that's not going to happen and that it's happening anyway, because that's what Charlton said, then he said, but it's happening anyway. If our response to that is, okay, then, well, it's not about race, that's where I have a problem. Mm -hmm. Once you hear that it isn't about a malicious person orchestrating it, but it's happening anyway, and we see the statistics, you can't shrug your shoulders then. You have to say, then, what is it, mm -hmm. right? If black people are poorer than white people on the whole, and you don't believe it's biological, <laughs> then what is it? Mm -hmm. What is it? And then find that answer. Mm -hmm. Because when you start to look for the answer, you realize it's not made by any person who's here now, mm -hmm. right? But it has not been, it's, it's failed to be disrupted by those of us who are here now. Mm -hmm. That's where I am. All right. I can I ask something quickly? Sure can. So I, I totally um, hear what you're saying in terms of like, it's not one specific malicious person, but when there are people in leadership positions that are perpetuating uh, white supremacy culture, is it, and like bringing about the rhetoric in, into more of a daily life, does that it, does that just enhance so pe more people are aware of the issues? Because obviously they existed in other uh, times or, but, or is it, is there really maybe one person that could be perpetuating it? And, you know, leadership roles, not just being maybe the president, but other people. Go ahead, well, I, 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 go ahead. I mean, I think it makes it easier to see how you know they're not necessarily one individual person somewhere kind of causing or making this happen but i think it does help to illuminate the fact that there is a sense in which power is real and thinking about those who make de decisions that affect uh large groups of people um and you can see how then that perception, that rhetoric that I might espouse translates into either disinterest when I'm faced with a choice or mm -hmm. uh, given an opportunity to disrupt the system by bit when you're in a position of power and saying, well, what's wrong? Or clearly, if this is happening here, as Stephen was saying, um, that these differences manifest themselves, then it's got to be something wrong about this group of people, right? And so, and I'm in a, a position of power to make a decision about a policy, a way of uh, acting that continues to main, maintain that status quo rather than disrupt. Mm -hmm. And so I think when you start to hear this kind of rhetoric um, from folks, at least for me, it helps to understand that why, while that person might not be the individual person putting the but pushing the button, it is easy to see that when you're in a position of power, you have tremendous power to act or not act. Mm -hmm. And that either 
disrupts or perpetuates the status quo and we continue to go nowhere. To whom yeah, much, I, is given, I, much is expected. Yeah, I worry about the normalizing of, of overt white supremacy. I worry about that, that, that allowing that to become part of the culture, I think is problematic. But I also think that, that the bigger problem for me, quite honestly, isn't that because in some ways that shines a light on it and, and as Charlton said it keeps it in the spotlight reminds us it's still there because it went before you know it it, it 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 was underground it was just it wasn't popular and people were ashamed of those feelings now they feel more emboldened to share them uh, and I, I think we should know that um, but but the bigger problem for me is that it sets the bar there mm -hmm. so that anybody can say well as long as I'm not a proud boy then I'm not racist as long as I'm not you know if I'm not I'm not running around with a torch going Jews will not replace us so I'm not anti-semitic Right, I don't have those problems because that's the problem. It's clans people, it's, it's Nazis, I'm not that. And I think if you set the bar there, it lets white folks in particular off the hook way too easily because then we don't feel like we have to do any of the work because we, and that's not new, that's Archie Bunker, right? That's like, you could always look for somebody who's more racist than you and go, I can't be racist because that's what racist looks like. Just the same way we look for somebody who's richer than us and say, I'm not rich because there's somebody richer, I'm not poor because there's somebody poorer, right? Once it's comparative, it takes us away from doing the work that's need to be done on a systemic level because we, we go back to where we were on the individual question. So I, I'm, I'm troubled by that um, of, of being the bar. Ex, you know, exposing neo-Nazis as still being out there is, you know, it's one thing. And then, but then when that becomes what a, what a real racist is, then all the racist thoughts and ideas that I might have just moving around the world pale in comparison. Therefore, I shouldn't have to deal with them anymore. I remember coming out of it. I'm just going to say, this is the last thing I'll say, which is the coming out of the last debate, right, where some of the uh, takeaway was, you know, Trump, Trump not being able to denounce white supremacy. And this was a big thing. And I'm like, holy shit. Is this, this is where we are as a country where the bar is. Marcus. Hi, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Steven's here. <laughs> <laughs> Where the bar is, you know, do we denounce over white supremacy or not? Like, that's where we get to focus all of our time. And it's like, that's, that's, mm -hmm. I think the telltale sign that we're, we're, you know, certainly staying in place, if not moving backwards. Right. Well, um, I could do this all night, guys, because, uh, I enjoy hanging out with you guys and hearing you talk and uh but uh you've you've been extremely generous with your time um and we really appreciate it so um, appreciate you all this is great. thanks for thanks for inviting us thanks for wrestling with these hard issues this isn't yeah. this isn't an easy class <laughs> <laughs>